um, well, I said the word context, historicizing, problematizing, contextualizing. Um, one of the things I did a couple years ago is a project called Urban Artistry. Um, and this project is part of a one day hopeful ambition of mine to have a nonprofit foundation dedicated to civic engagement. That's great getting you out there being civically engaged and stuff that didn't have anything to do with school just because you feel the need. Um, and this project grew out of a conversation I had with an older wise individual at a conference who said, young people today aren't proud of where they come from. I remember you know, being proud of my city, my street, my neighborhood, having some of that, you know, I am from, yes, it is what it is, but it's still my town. And I don't see young people doing that today. So um, that started my brain thinking more. And urban artistry grew out of it. Um, urban artistry is also part of, it's the first program that the Claude Harvard Foundation um, that I got a name for, and I pay for the name and all that. Um, <laughs> the Claude Harvard Foundation, um, which, is, which honors my grandfather, who's the per first person that actually showed me in, by his action what it means to be civically engaged. He's one of those people, you probably know those people who quit their job and they go do something else. Um, he, that's what he did. He, he retired, he didn't quit, he retired. Um, after a long career with, um, he worked for Ford, he worked for um, the U.S. tank arsenal, someplace like that, he worked for them. He was in World War II and he did those kinds of things and he retired. And when he retired, he went to, um, this place called Focus Hope. And Focus Hope, he helped them start their, br their blueprint um, class to teach young men, mostly, mostly African American in urban, in the city of Highland Park in Detroit, how to read and understand and create blueprints so they can get, they can have a viable skill. And he did that throughout his retirement, um, started that program. And, and it's through his actions that I really start to understand what it means to be civically engaged. You see something, you, you, you have the skills, you put them towards doing that. And my grandfather was a really, really humble man. Um, he, and I didn't know half the stuff he did until like, you know, the week before he passed away that I found all this stuff that he did. Um, so I named the foundation after him. And urban artistry, all these things coming together. My, I think what I have that naturally I like to do is write and write poetry. So what can I do with poetry? to try to bridge the gap and get young people to be civically engaged. Urban artistry came from that. Um, I did it during spring break in Detroit, um, just because that's my hometown. The idea is that urban artistry would travel around different places. And what we did was we used the city as the subject matter. I looked for high school students who were first interested in writing, because if they weren't, then it'd just be bad. Um, so we spent the week together using the city as our classroom which was great because I meant I didn't have to pay for anything. We did poetry because I did not have to pay myself. And um, I also worked with a local poet in Detroit. And what we did is we went to different areas. Some of these students had never been to the Detroit Histor Historical Museum. That was a classroom for a day. So each day we had a different site as a classroom. We did the Hart Plaza, which is the riverfront downtown. That was our classroom on day one, extremely cold. But we were out there. Um, classroom day two, the Detroit Historical Museum, the D main library, um, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and the African American History um, Museum. So each day we're at a different site. And the idea is that we talked about poetry, and every day when they learned something about their city or they went to some place they hadn't been before, they had to go home that night and write what did that mean to them. And at the end of this week, we ended up with a um, presentation, a poetry reading at a bookstore in downtown Detroit. And one of the best things that came from this was a student who literally just despised the city. She can't, couldn't wait till she graduated so she can get out of Detroit. Um, and if you've seen where she lived, you will understand that. You'd be like, I'll help you leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but at the end of this week, one of the things she said is that I, I'm still leaving, but I understand a lot more about my city and I have something to, to appreciate about my city. So I got her halfway there. She can leave, but she might come back. So, um, and what I'm gonna show you is very amateur clips from that week of the students 
doing um, a couple of different things. And I think it embodies the idea of spirit, that trying to get people to understand just where they are. Um, um, I'm going to try to fast forward here because I don't want this part. There we go. This is Ashley. Ashley is a very talented young writer, and she doesn't like to be on camera very much. That's why she buries herself. Um, but she writes a lot. She's a 10th grader, um, and she was homeschooled. So I had two homeschool kids and then three kids. I had a 19-year-old who was turning 20 in a couple months who was in 12th grade. He was determined. <laughs> Whatever happened, he stayed in school. and. Um, he was determined to get his high school diploma and didn't want to do other kinds of alternative education. Ashley, do you have an explanation for what a haiku is? This is the artist who helped me. She's what local to the city. <laughs> can you, I don't know if you can hear this. Right now, they're, we're discussing haiku and what it, what, what, what's a haiku. She, Ashley was big on writing haiku. Right. You're going to read some haiku today. I'm not going to do all the work. That we wrote yesterday, along with um, a villanelle, which is a 19-line French term. And my son wrote one of those. It's very simplified. And he did not come, and I did not force him to come, <laughs> as I forced him previously to attend the other six days of the yes. church. <laughs> but I'm going to read this poem because I was so impressed that he grasped the concept so they learn different different forms of poetry so they it wasn't all just free verse so a young grasshopper young grasshopper lies in the field and has crops for supper and gets rougher rise young grasshopper days will only get rougher rise in the field and have crops for supper Seems to be getting rougher inside, young grasshopper. The day it was foster lies in the fields and has crops for supper. It's a surfer, fly, young grasshopper, in the fields and has crops for supper. And that is a poem that has, what, six shortcuts and one <laughs> And it's just, you know, a repetitious, uh, poem, once you get like your first three lines, you take two of them and put them in various places during the poem, and then you have like six lines at the same time. But I was so impressed with that. This po first poem is um, history. Um, and she was, she was our educator on the scene, because I was busy trying to do everything else. Um, but again, the students, we, we had a textbook that we read from, but the idea was to take what their discoveries every day. They had to keep a journal, take their discoveries, go home and create poetry out of it. And hopefully at the end of that week, they all will have something uniquely to say about themselves and about their city. And for not knowing what we were going to get, it turned out very well. So this is a project I hope to do in other places not just with poetry. Um, I hope to do it here next in Grand Rapids because this is my next home. Detroit is my first home. This is my next home. Um, so one of these spring breaks, um, hope to do it here with, and it picks particularly up on high school students because in what I realized that in a lot of what we hear about our cities, we usually get from outside, from media, and we don't usually get the youth voice. And I picked on high school students because they're that next, at a, at a place if they're gonna go on they're going to get jobs, they're going to go to school, what they're going to do. So how do we get their voices in to what, it, what does it mean to come from where they come from? What does, what does it mean to know their cities? Um, do you know about the Urban Deanery, their, their uh, poetry that goes Yeah, okay. here on yeah. the second and third, second and fourth Tuesdays of the um, month. So if you're interested in local, we do have that here. Um, so working with the urban artistry, 
was good because it it was the first opportunity I had. Why my computer shutting down? I don't know. It was the first opportunity I had to, you know, it wasn't about how much money I had or how much time and all those type of resources. We had people interested in writing, um, and I had the means to do that. So the students were able to produce really good work. Um, and I'm working on it. I have their, their work collected in a um, chat book. And thanks to the English department, some of my colleagues have read those uh, works and came up with questions for them. So the idea is that now we have a product that if the city, the school district wanted to use, they could use that as a book of explanation and exploration of their own hometowns and their study questions and things like that in that text. So that's just one example of contextualizing um, an experience. It just happened that the students I worked with in this case were all African American, but they were all something else. They were all urban. They came from urban settings. So they had something interesting, maybe not at first to say. As you hear, some of the kids were forced to do this by their parents, um, and some of them wanted to do it. But at the end, they all had a really good experience. So that's one example of keeping or trying to find the spirit of something. Um, my next example is. Um, a project that I'm going to ask you all to help me do. So much fun, so much fun. Here, take one of those and pass it down that side, and you can have one, and you can pass it down this side. As you get your little slip, it has a haiku on it. And then um, there are 15 haikus circulating out there. I only have 30. I didn't know how, what kind of crowd I was going to get. So I have 30. Um, <clears throat> this haiku is attempting to talk about the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, and capture some of that in a poem. And in this case, there's 15 linked poems. Um, this set of haiku will be available to you soon, actually in October, in September. It's going to be part of a a collective art exhibit where there are artists um, who have selected a haiku and they're interpreting it visually. And that's going to be on display as part of our year-long celebration or remembrance of the transatlantic slave trade, the abolishment of the transatlantic slave trade, where Great Britain in 200 years ago decided that we should stop going to Africa and getting people. Mm, we're going to say, no, you can't do that anymore. So it was a parliamentary act that they said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. A year later, in 1808, America said, OK, we're not going to do that anymore, which didn't end slavery, but it was one of the movements um, that eventually led to the end of slavery as we know it today, the type of slavery that we had in America. So <clears throat> there's a lot of information about um, slavery in America. You have um, slave narratives, autobiographies, things like that. Um, but there's not, and then there's, a, there's not a lot, I didn't think, even in poetry, that talks about the experiences on the water. So I had this bright idea. I always have bright ideas that become incredibly hard tasks for me to do. Um, I was teaching at Penn State a creative writing class. At the time, I should not have been teaching it. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing it myself. and like, hey, I should teach that, and they, and they let me. And, <laughs> and then I had a classroom full of students. And we had to do the haiku. And they were like, this is so easy. Haiku is easy. It's about, it's a Japanese art form, usually about nature. It has 17 syllables, five syllables in the first line, seven in the middle, and five in the last. And they're like, second graders can do this. And, and I'm the type of person that I tend to take on the <coughs> personality of my class. So I was like, yeah, I guess this is easy. I know I'll make it hard. I'm going to tell the story of the middle passage in haiku. Two years later, <laughs> I had 13 haiku that I was working on. Um, <laughs> so I did all this research, and then got to reduce it all down to 17 syllables. That was stupid. I mean, it was a challenge. <laughs> and what you have in front of me, and, and I did it. It took me two years. I did it. I'm like, OK. I tested it on people, and I'm like, OK, I can see that, feel that, what have you. But I'm like, what do I do with it? So now I have something to do with it, which is this um, collaborative project. But another thing I like to do is to share it. And for us, it, now, you are going to make or break this poetry. 
piece right here. It's going to be all about you. So if you leave today and you're like, that haiku thing sucked, it wasn't just because of me, OK? <laughs> So if you have one, if I had enough, I had 30 of them. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do is try to recreate, recreate a, a mood, a feeling of this experience. <coughs> so they all should be numbered, but that really doesn't make a difference. I'm going to ask you to, when I point to you, I'm going to ask you to read your haiku. And once you start to read your haiku, I want you to, after you complete it, take a pause and then read it again and until I give you some caribou net like stop thing, <laughs> even though most of you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. So all of these are attempting to be pieces on the ship. There's only one that, that doesn't occur on the water. So we're just going to see what happens because that's what I do. All right, you ready? So everybody, you read it, pause, you're going to read it again. When I point to you, so don't jump the gun, because you're all excited. OK? They pushed them off one by one, only mourning the profit margin loss. They pushed them off one by one, only mourning the profit margin loss. Captain Kosi's notes to God-filled prayers hopeful. They are never you. I tell you to stop. See, you messed the whole thing. Uh -huh. no, don't stop. You're gonna keep going. Even when I add everybody, you're going to keep going. Yes. <laughs> you're going to. I said you're going to start when I point to you, but I didn't tell you to stop. Okay, you ready? I'm not gonna start with you again then. <laughs> okay. He hears her body breaking. Realizes they do more than eat than eat flesh. He hears her body breaking, realizes they do more than eat flesh. And shackles he dark, hears her body breaking, sound, under sad pain, but not more than eat flesh. And shackles he dark, hears her body breaking, under sad pain, but not eat flesh. They push off one by one, on the morning, the prophet might be shackles dark, he hears her body breaking, but not eat flesh. They push them off one by one, on the morning, the prophet might be shackled dark, he hears her body breaking, but not eat flesh.
You all can stop. Because Europe yanked one thigh. Africa held the other. Red S L Agua. And that's that. Okay. So what did you think about that reading? That's very good. <laughs> Got noisy. Uh huh. I thought of a million black voices by Richard Wright. Okay. What else? What did you think of that reading? What could you think about when you're reading with the other voices going on? Uh huh. A lot of people are trying to talk over other people, so they're saying it louder. Okay. Uh huh. I'm trying to find somebody like me <laughs> in this experience. It reminded you of the hold of the slave ship. Okay. This side of room, you're losing. <laughs> Anybody get tired of reading theirs? <laughs> I got tired of him reading his. It's a lot of Spanish. <laughs> a little bit. Es el agua, which means, can anybody help me out? What does that mean? It is red. It is water. Yeah, red is the water. Um, so that little light bulb might go off for some of you. Like, oh, okay, I didn't know what she was talking about. But that's what it means. Red is el agua. And even for people who got tired of reading yours, that's part of the experience too. Guess what? I'm tired of this. But there's nothing you can do. It's, that's what it is. That's whatever your, your life is. And think about the, the, the help me out history people from being taken at the point to where you may end up could be over a year, right? Or yeah, give me some real hard numbers, Mike. Right? That's why you're here. Past, yeah. 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 From, Six to eight months. So yeah, I'm pretty sure people got tired. That's part of the experience too. Um, mm -hmm. It's like uh, just assuming the red meant the blood in the water. I'm a poet, so I should let you go with it. Yes, but everybody's going to be right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, when I wrote it, when I wrote the only one that really is like the first one, they're numbered by the order that I wrote them, not any kind of making sense order. Um, in that very first one, I try to get the major players in this. So I try to get, yes, what we know of as European, but what I found a lot of times that the, the Spanish was usually left out, so that's why there's Spanish in there. Um, so I try to get the, you know, what we associate with the European countries, Africa itself, but also the Spaniards in that, in that very first one. Um, mm -hmm. When you're saying this, you, you <coughs> You hear what you're saying, and as it gets further across the room, it just becomes a din. And as she said, it must have been like what it was in the ship. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That I mean, you could I could hear him saying things. I mean, I could understand words and words and words. And then over there it was noise, and further over there was kind of a cadence, mm -hmm. and I understood it with words, but I couldn't hear the words, couldn't understand the words individually. But it was just um, a human noise that um, was filling the space, but it was unintelligible. You know what's? So I'm sorry. What's interesting is that we know all these are related because you told us so at the beginning, but I only got this little piece. So when I'm reading, I wanted to stop and listen. It's like you want to understand what everyone else is saying and going through, but you can't because you're so focused on you, which must have been how folks felt. Even if you want to have empathy or sympathy for the person next to you, your survival is at stake. And so you have to focus on you no matter how compelling the other person is. Mm -hmm. Are you going to say something? Well, I actually was saying oh. the same line of thought is that create the longing mm -hmm. to hear what others were saying and, and, and feeling from this message. And, and when you're down, and you know, we know that most of the people who were taken didn't, weren't able to communicate. So even if, if I wanted to put myself aside and wanted to figure out, I couldn't speak their dialect. I couldn't understand. So it, it remained noise to me. Uh huh. So do we know? some of the ways that they connected, you know, during that passage? Hey, I just write poetry, man. No. Oh, I'm <laughs> you guys. There you go. That's why we have other people in the room. Maybe I have some commonality mm -hmm. in terms of the, uh, the phrases from, in, from different languages, like the Senegal, the language, the uh, format of that language may have a greater connection to the other languages from, uh, from West Africa. So even though, it, and I, it reminded me when listening to the, the last two, you and, and whoever was over here speaking, I think you said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so listening to that, I'm thinking, wow, on the ship, eventually, they had to stop with the different Bibles, they had to stop, stop, and listen to those who had some similarity to what they were saying. And we do know that there was a language, because we have studied it now, and know there was a language that on the, in the passage, when they make it on the uh, you know, passage, that there, some commonality there. Mm -hmm. And to those who could, could make that connection with that commonality, especially the language of the and Senegal, they could make a connection and then the others perhaps just quiet it down just to hear that. Yeah. Hear that. Wait a minute. So maybe something in my language too is coming to this, this language. So this becomes the apex of this and all the others begin to say, let's quiet down and let's see how we can connect here. So they, they're going to have yeah. some connection, some kind of, some even some verbal connection, but it's going to take a while for it to happen. It's going to take some quietness to, just like she quiet us down. So why does it hear that what's going to come out? Oh, I need to be back here. I don't know if there was any conscious intent on this, and maybe it's the analytical, but uh, we're, we all had a passage that referred to the passage. Yeah. And was there any intent? I mean... What exactly is your question? <laughs> <laughs> was there any intent? <laughs> to, uh, to was what? it uh, calculated? Was it on purpose? Was it just accidental that several people refer to it? Well, in my passage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no, I'm um, making this passage. Yeah. Obviously, well, it's a passage, and uh, we're passengers, <laughs> but we're not passengers. <laughs> we're just not Sometimes you can go too. F no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Overkill? No. No, it, it, no, it, it is. That, that is intentional. Because when I, when I put them, my, my, I was attempting to try to capture different perspectives, imagining for myself people on a ship, all those people. Um, if you look at, if you have number 14 or 15, that's, that's a different perspective. Um, 14 says, captives' closeness moves. To God filled prayers, hopeful they are never you. So I try to have different, it's not just the people who were being treated as goods that had a stake in this. Everybody had a stake in this. Um, I imagine people signed up to work on the ship, got on the ship, and were like, oh my goodness. I, this wasn't in the job description, but. This is, this is what I need to do and I, for my, whatever my livelihood happens to be. Um, so I, I try to capture those different takes on it um, because there, there are different perspectives. Um, one of the hardest 
things I had with this uh, project, moving it from poetry to something that's multidisciplinary, getting artists and musicians, composers to pick a haiku and interpret it. So most of them said, well, I don't understand. This is uh, how I, I can contribute to this because this is like a black thing. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not. It's, it's a whole lot of people perspective in this. And if I'm going to you know, do something with this, I need other perspectives. So I think that's one of the, the very difficult things when we look at our American history is we like to regulate things to different groups of people. And that it just doesn't work out that way. It's not that clean and neat. Um, so that's why, and by the way, I have to say, you did it the best. I ever <laughs> had a group of people try to do this. You were the bestest at it. It was beautiful. So um, thank you for that. Um, I do have one other. I, I figure I'll take you on a serious passage. Then we'll skip down a weird kind of funny road on the way back. So let's um, in my few minutes left here to this. Well, that is the whole thing available for people yeah, who would like to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> with the, the haiku? Yeah. I think most of them, here's my commercial. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Nearly all of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight of them. <laughs> um, if you want all of them, I can get you, but eight of them and some more of my work is in this book called Open This Door, which only our bookstore has, because <laughs> it's that exclusive. Um, <laughs> for six dollars, you can have some of my other poems, and eight of them are in here. But September the 5th, when they open in our um, art gallery, all 15 of them will be there, not just the poetry, but the art itself that's been interpreted. So stay on the lookout for that. Um, that cool, amazing thing happening. Um, I'll show you this. This is a cool thing. I like to look at this. Oh, it's not up there. Never mind. <laughs> Get back with my technology here. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Those are my poems by title. I took a picture of it. <laughs> oh, he walked cool. Um, oh, he walked cool. I, I have people who know me. I'm so glad there's a camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are my poetry readings? We, we have to get through this one. This is just a crowd pleaser for some people I hear. I've made some updates for those of you who've seen this before, so bear with me. Oh, this is my test one. <laughs> Struvio Camellis replies to the U.S. ostrich situation. What is it with you American morons? Footnote. <laughs> Can you see? Do I need to move this? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Making chicken of thee, this delicacy tastes like beef. Eat beef then, you dumb, slow, moo. These four toes have graced ancient land, Africa, Asia, Europe, too. Go look. You will find my bones that once walked with dinosaurs, though now I've settled for African indigenous. Footnote. <laughs> the ostrich is old as hell. <laughs> once found on three continents, it is now becoming endangered in the wild.
give you time to take in the ostrich. www.ostrich.org, you erroneously report of Africa and me, where it, ostriches, have been raised commercially for more than 100 years. There is nothing commercial about us. Footnote, this website is dedicated to supporting U.S. ostrich farming. They even have an educational scholarship. Unlike me and Florida, we are intimate. Her landscape complements my gracious neck, powerful legs, supple plumage. We are reciprocal. She feeds me, I fertilize her. She knows I don't need flight with limbs that carry me swift as breeze. Footnote, ostriches can reach speeds of up to 40 miles an hour and sustain it for 30 minutes. She knows my lashes batting so whimsically don't mean I'm cute. She knows the sharpness of my toenails can take down mighty foes, tigers, lions, leopards. Floridian farmers had no chance. Footnote, many a Floridian farmer found out about the ostrich strength the hard way. <coughs> she knows my features don't succumb to gawkiness, begging to be hidden in dirt, but elegance that has chosen her over two other continents. Footnote, no, they don't bury their heads. You bobo. Footnote, the ostrich is pissed. Money, 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 you thought of profiting from me, particularly Floridians, who in the late 80s sank millions into gaining from my flesh. The triple SSS ostrich farm in Ascala Blue, 170,000 on my girls and me. Footnote. A university professor who studies non-chicken fowl described the large amounts of money invested in Florida's ostrich farms as a system akin to pyramid schemes whose bottom was itching to fall out. To just sell our offspring to dimwits who chomp down on their warm ground bodies and say, tastes like chicken like they do anything new. Actually, ostrich tastes, well, like ostrich. <laughs> Footnote, ostrich has less fat and cholesterol than beef, and as one almost out of business farmer says, I've raised cows and I've raised, I've been in the hog business, and the worst piece of meat on this ostrich is better than the best piece of prime rib, I tell you. Well, duh, footnote, the ostrich does not think highly of U.S. intelligence. But you didn't count on unsportsmanlike behavior from cow clubbers. Footnote, the conspiracy theor story, fearful, of fearful beef producers use their money to botch ostrich marketing then anonymously purchased Florida's only slaughterhouse equipped to handle a bird that size. Mysteriously, the slaughterhouse burned down a few months later, forcing farmers to slaughter by hand. Well, that slowed business down a bit, to say the least. Or, the U.S. consumer's singular interest in trendy items. Footnote, American consumers or stupid. <laughs> Idiots not looking for real culinary change, but another opportunity to name one more exotic creature, chicken. You're not happy that brand name consumption has profitably reduced Triple S's population from 3,000 to 45. For the sake of saying, I tried ostrich meat. Footnote, 
they made money before the bottom fell out. I swear when I die on this fledgling Floridian ostrich farm and find my way into a designer mouth that even thinks the word chicken, I will churn your belly raw, you ignorant baboon. Footnote. and force you to extrapolate me from your gut with the help of emergency room shopkeepers who've worked 13 days straight. I'll wait until the next day to release upon you a coup that overtakes your intestines, keeping your ass running several days more with the rhetorical question. <laughs> Who's chicken now? Help me. Footnote. That's my ostrich poem. Yeah. No, this is a modified picture. They don't really have teeth like that. <laughs> the number one question I get. So, in, in wrapping up, this, you know, this is just spiritful. I don't know whose spirit it is. It was an interesting project. It was an assignment. So you who are in class, look what can happen to an assignment. It has possibilities. Um, it was an assignment that I had to write about an animal. And I happened to be in Florida. And that was all brand new to me. That people had these ostrich farms. So I did a lot of research. I tend to do a lot of research for my, for my poetry. Um, the Middle Passage wants tons of research, two years to write 15 little poems. Um, currently, I'm working on, I've done it to myself again. Currently, I'm working on a set of poems that I saw a documentary. It's called The 381 Days Bus Boycott in Birmingham. I saw this like last year. That's why you shouldn't watch TV. I'm like, wouldn't it be cool to like write a poem for every one of those days? No. <laughs> But it is currently my massive, just when I don't have anything to do, project to, um, to write on. And, and today I, I have um, five. So <laughs> it's not anything that I'm working to um, finish like this year. But I, I was inspired by the, the, really the spirit and the drive and mainly the women, the, I'm sorry guys, the women who said, who, who spread the word, they talk, we talk, you know? So the women really held that together for us. And, and that's, that's another story because of Madhutai. <laughs> Thank you.